If you have your Bible, then I would invite you to turn to John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. John chapter 1, I'll begin by reading from verse 14. So, brothers and sisters, this is God's holy and inerrant word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Well, we have spent four Sundays walking through John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. And this section of the gospel is known as John's prologue. And it was John's way of providing a general overview of what would take place in the entire gospel of John. And just by a recap, by way of reminder, John has introduced to us uh, to this divine figure called the Word, found in verses two, 1 to 2. And we know later in John's gospel that the Word, this Word is referring to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, who is also God, the second person of the Trinity. And that the Word is the transcendent God who has eternally coexisted with the Father unto eternity, before the creation of the world. And then John continues to describe the Word, that the Word is also the creator of the universe, found in verses 3 to 5, and that all things came into existence through Jesus Christ, and that in Jesus Christ, the source of life and light is found in him. John would then introduce us to another man named John, who is also known as John the Baptist in verses 6 to 8. And in this gospel, if you remember, John the Baptist played the role of being a witness for Jesus Christ so that all might believe in Jesus through his testimony. And then in verses 9 to 12, John tells us that there will always be those who respond to the word, respond to Jesus Christ in one of two ways. First, you can receive him as your Lord and Savior. Or second, you can reject him. And we have come to the final portion in verses 14 to 18. And during the Christmas Eve service, I have expounded verse 14 quite extensively. And we remember that this eternal word, this God, God the Son, who have existed for all eternity, chose to assume the human nature or to become flesh, or God becoming man, and that God has made himself known in the person of Jesus Christ. And we and and the rest of the historic churches confess and believe that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. And so as we unfold the ending of John's prologue, we're going to learn about the, the uniqueness of the eternal word, the uniqueness of the eternal word. Uh, And the main point I want to drive home this morning uh, for you to remember is this, that Jesus is the one and only unique Son of God. Jesus is the one and only unique Son of God. Now, I want to return to verse 14 to highlight a line that I did not cover in depth for my previous message. You see, John says here in verse 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then there's a single Greek word that I think is important, and that is the word monogenes, monogenes. In my English Standard Version, the word, that word would be translated as the only. 
Your NIV may say, the one and only. I like the older Bible translations of the word, and that is the only begotten, the only begotten son. Uh, and this word, begotten, is also repeated in the famous John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, we don't use the word begotten much, and maybe some of you don't even know what that word means. But if you grew up with the King James Version, then you may be familiar with that word. And not only that, this word is also used in verse 14. Not only used in verse 14, but it's also used in verse 18. If you, if you go, to the, go to verse 18 in your own Bibles, that no one has ever seen God, and it says, the only God. The only God. Perhaps a better translation is this. The only begotten God, or the only begotten Son, who is God. Now, I think it is important to retrieve the word begotten back into our English translations because it helps us to understand the historic doctrine of the Trinity, particularly the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. Now, just to give you a note, this is a little bit like a Lerman, if you will, tiny bit of Lerman. If you don't know what Lerman is, it means lecture and sermon you know, breakfast and lunch, you have brunch. So we have Lerman here, a little bit of lecture, a little bit of sermon. So I'll try my best to keep this explanation simple and brief, but you'll have to really put on your thinking cap this morning. Uh, there was once a churchman who told his pastor, sir, pastor, your sermons go over my head. And the pastor simply just says to him, brother, just lift up your head. So just do that if you want. But anyways, what exactly does the word monogenes or begotten mean? Well, you'll be hard-pressed to find the historic definition using a current dictionary because it defines begotten or beget as to procreate or to generate an offspring. Uh, and without any historic understanding of, of the, and the meaning of the word begotten, one can easily come to the conclusion that God, the Son, was a created being. Uh, in the fourth century, there was a presbyter and priest named Arius who denied the deity of Jesus Christ. He denied that Jesus was God and said he believed that Jesus Christ was a created being. Arius was then condemned for heresy, but he got a name for his teaching known as Arianism, which declared that Jesus Christ was not tru a truly divine being a truly divine being, but a created being. And in fact, there are many modern teachings of Arianism in our day. You don't need to drive that far in, within the radius of our church. Within one radius of our church, you have the Jehovah Witness. You have the Mormon church, or quote unquote church. And then just on 41st and Oak, you have the Unitarians and many, many other false religions that deny the deity of Jesus Christ. However, the word monogenes, or the word begotten, does not imply and it does not mean that Jesus was created by God. That's not what it means. You see, during the fourth century, there was a creed that was written by the Council of Nicaea, known as the Nicene Creed. It is a very comprehensive explanation to the doctrine of the Trinity that is held by or historic Orthodox Christians. So if you're interested in that, uh, that, that creed, you can just type it on Google, Nicene Creed. But essentially, the Nicene Creed, they didn't invent the doctrine of the Trinity. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that way. They didn't invent the doctrine of the Trinity. Rather, they went to the scriptures and they confessed and affirmed this truth about God the Son, that he was begotten, not made. And plus, Jesus being the begotten son does not mean Jesus the forgotten son. I just heard about it recently, and I found it interesting. But what the word begotten essentially conveys is that Jesus was the one and the only unique son from the Father. But how? How is he the one and only unique son from the Father? Just to kind of give you an illustration, all of you, myself included, we have been begotten by our parents. 
The truth is that you came forth from your parents in a sense that you carried their DNA. That is what makes you unique. Of course, this illustration, this illustration falls apart and it falls short because you are a created being and God the Son is not. But I hope you just get a sense of what begotten means. See, the Father begets the Son and the Son eternally begotten from the Father's essence. The Son did not become the begotten Son when he was born in the world. The Son did not become begotten when he was baptized by John. Rather, the Son was eternally begotten or generated from the Father before the foundation of the world. And by generated, the historic meaning is that the Son came forth from the Father's divine essence. See, just as a child, the created being, shares his or her DNA with the parents, so the Son, the uncreated being, shares in the same divine essence and substance as the Father. And a fancy word is called consubstantial. That's a million-dollar word. You're welcome. But that word may just have flew over your head. But essentially, that is what makes the Son the one and only unique Son from the Father is that he shares in the same essence, shares in the same substance as the Father. And if you want to do more study on the doctrine of the Trinity, you can Google this phrase, uh, the eternal generation of the Son. The eternal generation of the Son. Now, maybe you're asking, why should I care about this? Why are you talking about this? Why is it important for me to know about this? Well, Jesus, the only begotten Son, distinguished himself from those who are born children of God in verses 12 to 13. If you look back in verses 12 to 13, John says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who are born of God. So we are children of God, and while we are indeed children of God, for those of us who have believed in Jesus Christ, We are only adopted children of God. We're not the one and only unique son son and daughters of God. But Jesus, the one and only unique God, the unique son of God, who alone can save sinners. You and I cannot save anybody. Only Jesus can. In fact, theologians, theologian Matthew Barrett says this, and I quote, it is only because Jesus is the eternally begotten son that he is able and qualified to descend into the deep depths of this God-forsaken world, be born as a babe in a manger, and ascend back to his father with a host of newborn sons in his wake, end quote. So in other words, see, the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men may become sons of God. And so that is what makes Jesus the one and only unique Son of God. And John will explain that because Jesus is the one and only unique Son of God, that he's the begotten Son of God, he is greater than all the prophets. He is greater than all the prophets. And we see that in verse 15, where, where John says that, where, where John talks about John the Baptist here. John the author briefly brings John the Baptist back into the prologue, and we remember him and found in verses 6 to 8 that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came, to, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but, to, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, if you remember, John the Baptist was the final prophet under the Old Covenant. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he is the one who preached the message of repentance and baptism. And we remember, we remember that John is not the light, but he came to bear witness about the true light. But in this verse, in verse 15, there's no mention of the light theme. Rather, the theme that continues on is that he is a witness. He is here to bear witness about Jesus Christ. Now, what is the reason for the author to talk about John the Baptist in this section in the gospel? Why is he bringing him back in this, in, this, in this scenario? What I think the author might be doing is to reinforce the idea of the preeminence of Jesus. 
as the unique Son of God. And John the Baptist declares and testifies his greatness. John would say something similar if you jump down to verses 29 to 31 of John chapter 1. John wrote this, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, to, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And so Jesus, he began his public ministry after John's public ministry. But John here declares that Jesus ranks and he came before him. And if you know the relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist, they're actually cousins. Jesus, John was older than Jesus by about six months. And you can read the account in Luke chapter 1 to 2. But in the ancient culture, it was viewed that the older would be more important and that, he, and that the older one would be viewed highly than the younger one. But this situation is reversed, isn't it? That John testifies that Jesus, he's mightier and greater than he. And John the Baptist is making the point that Jesus is preeminent. He is first. He is the greatest of all. And the author uses John's witness to testify the truth of who Christ is. See, Jesus is the eternal word who was begotten for eternity, which is why John the Baptist says that Jesus ranks before him because he was before him, because Jesus Christ came before John ever existed and was born. John acknowledges that he is greater than him, even though he's older than Jesus. And so, John then points to everybody. He, joined, he points the Jews to Jesus because he's greater than all the prophets, and even the final prophet like John himself. And so, because Jesus is the one and only unique Son of God, he is greater than all the prophets. And we learn a second lesson here. He is the source of greater grace, found in verses 16 to 17. You see, John begins with the word for. If you notice in your Bible, this is, it's very important to, when you do Bible study, it's important to know grammar, because the word for is very important. One single word can change a meaning of a text. And so this word for can also be translated to because. That's how we know that this verse is connected with the previous verse when following John's logic here. See, based on John the Baptist's testimony to the superiority and the preeminence of Jesus as the only unique son of God, John the author also testifies, along with the testimony of those who have received Jesus Christ, the superiority and the fullness of his grace. His grace. And this word grace here is mentioned four times in this passage, verse 14, twice in verse 16, and again in verse 17. Just a little fun little fact for you, I don't want to share with you is that the only time that John, the author, talks about grace in the whole entire gospel is in his prologue. He doesn't, doesn't talk about it again. He doesn't use that word again for the entire gospel of John. And you may be, you may be asking, oh, why is that? Well, I'll, I'll allow you to do that homework for me. But John says that grace upon grace, grace upon grace here, is understood as Jesus' super abundance of grace found in Jesus Christ. He is full of grace. He's so gracious to us, even when we are, haven't been gracious towards others, even though we are sinful. And that is a possible way of actually reading this text. And that is theologically accurate of understanding the grace of Jesus Christ, that even though we have fallen short of, of the glory of God, Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for our sins. But I want to suggest an alternative reading of this text. You know, it, it can be translated as grace upon grace, but if, you, if you, your English Bible your Bible translation would say this in a footnote, if you have footnotes here. 
It can also be translated as grace in place of grace, or grace instead of grace. That's actually in the Greek text. So it sounds like there's a grace that is being substituted by grace. And if that is the way we should read the text from the original language, then what is this grace that John is referring to? What is grace in place of grace? Seems like John is talking about there, there are two kinds of graces going on. Well, it will help us to understand and connect verse 16 to verse 17. When John talks about the law and Moses. See, Moses was an important character here in verse 17. He was an important character in the Old Testament. He was the prophet that God used to rescue the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. And that God gave the Israelites the law through Moses from Mount Sinai. And the law encompasses the Ten Commandments, of course, and some theologians would organize the law in three broad categories. There's the moral law, there's the ceremonial law, which is all the sacrifices and stuff, and then there's the civil law, where it teaches people how to relate to each other in, in, in Israelite society. But what I think that the law that John is referring to is the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. The word Torah in Hebrew means the law. And if you're familiar with the law, that you may know that the law served as a guardian or a schoolmaster that gave strict disciplines for the behavior of the Israelites. Now, you may think that the law is just harsh, it's bad. You know, when you, read, when you, when I, when you start reading the Bible again in 2024, you just read, you have to go through and plow through the laws and and you're just like, I don't want to read this part, but thank you, Jesus, that I don't have to keep all those laws. But the law itself should also and can also be understood as a display of grace since it was given by God through Moses, right? In fact, the Apostle Paul says that the law is holy and good and righteous in Romans chapter 7. And, the law, and that the law reveal God's character. It reveals his holiness. It reveals his perfect standard. And moreover, the law also reveals oh, how fallen short we are as, as, as human beings. We are not perfect. And it reveals so much of our sins and our fallenness. And what the law could also not do was transform the hearts of the Israelites. If you look at the history of the Israelites, they just kept rebelling against God. They kept breaking the law. But the law, God designed the law as a means to demonstrate to, even to us, everyone's sinfulness in order to show and point us to the need for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who became the perfect sacrifice for sin once and for all. And in fact, speaking of the law, Jesus Christ obeyed God's law perfectly on our behalf. And so what John is doing here, he's actually not putting Moses, he's not pitting Moses and Jesus against each other. Jesus says that he, he did not come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. And that Jesus held Moses and the law in high esteem. In fact, when confronting the religious leaders, John, Jesus said this in John chapter 5, verses 45 to 46, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. You see, what John is saying here is that the, the display of grace the display of grace that is revealed in the law is going to be substituted by the grace and truth through Jesus Christ. And with the coming of Jesus Christ, the law of grace in the Old Testament is replaced by grace and truth through Jesus. Jesus came to demonstrate the superiority of his greater grace. His grace is lavish and rich. His grace is greater than the law. Jesus is the source of all grace and blessings. 
That's why it's grace in place of grace, at least if I read it correctly. And that under the new covenant, we get to receive and experience the fullness of God's gracious blessing through Jesus Christ. And that Christ made a way of salvation for wretched and hell-bound sinners through his death and resurrection. And it is by grace that we are saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We don't only receive grace once in our lives when we have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but God's grace is a constant reality for all of our Christian life here on earth. Our Christian life is the life of grace that God lavishes upon us. And when we sin, God is gracious to forgive us. When we make mistakes in our life, God is gracious in working out our mistakes for his own glorious purpose and good. And every single day, we experience God's grace over and over and over again because God's grace is rich, it's infinite. In fact, if you're still following Jesus after many years, it's because of God's grace upon you. Because God's grace sustains you. He preserves you. And as Christians, we learn to show grace and also truth towards others who have failed us, even though, we don't, even though they don't deserve it. And I'll fail you too, as a pastor too, if I can be honest. I'll fail you too. But I hope that you'll be gracious to me as God has been gracious to you. That's why we sing Amazing Grace. Oh, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And so we've learned about Jesus being the source of greater grace. And finally, because Jesus is the only one and only unique Son of God, he is the greater revelation of the Father. The greater revelation of the Father. John says, no one has ever seen God, the only God, or the only begotten God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. See, what makes Jesus unique is that he has seen God. He has seen God. Now, there may be some folks in the Old Testament who have, quote-unquote, seen God, but they didn't really truly see him face to face because God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. However, Moses did did get to see the back of God's glory, but not his face. And so because Jesus is the only begotten Son, who is also God, he has been at the Father's side for all eternity. You see, we remember in verses 1 to 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Can you imagine God the Father and God the Son knowing each other for eternity? And when Jesus come in, came into the world, he can explain who God is, his Father is perfectly. I'm sure some of you may experience that, especially if you're married. If you've been married for many years, you know your spouse pretty well, right? If you don't know your spouse pretty well, well, we've we got to talk. <laughs> Um, but you, you know what I'm saying, right? If you know your spouse is really well, then you can explain who she is or who he is to your friends. This is what, what, this is what she's like. This is what he's like. But of course, you have not spent eternity with your spouse for eternity, right? But for God, for God the Son, he is able to explain who the Father is perfectly. Jesus came into the world to re- to reveal and make the Father known to all of us. He is the explanation of God. He is the revelation of God. He is the answer to this ultimate question. What is God like? As we have read in John chapter 14, Philip asked, show us the Father. But Jesus said to him, if you've seen me, if you know me, Philip, then you have seen and know the Father. However, if you reject the Father, no, if you reject Jesus, then you reject the Father. 
If you deny the, if you deny the Son, then you deny the Father as well. If you want to know who God is and you want to know what God is like, then get to know who Jesus is from the pages of Scripture. Because Jesus was in the beginning with God. He was at the Father's side during the creation of the world. And he was even in the Father's side before the creation of the world. You can only know through Jesus through his word. That is why my deep conviction as a pastor is to preach God's word verse by verse because I want you to know and see Christ for the pages of sacred scripture. And I want to make known to you what God has spoken to us in the scriptures. And, if you, and so if you see and know Christ, and I pray if, that, you, that God has opened up your heart to marvel and to see the glory of Christ through the pages of scripture. And if you do see him, then you know the Father as well. And plus, as we, as we are about to enter into 2024, let me ask you a question. How is your Bible reading 2023? See, you cannot truly know God if you don't read the Bible, right? Uh, God does not speak except in his word. God, can, God speaks to us through his word. And so I encourage you, if you have not been consistently or regularly reading your Bible, then begin knowing Jesus in the New Testament. Be- or begin the, the discipline again of reading the Bible regularly. But I hope that the new year, as the New Year is coming up, it's not just another burst of motivation, because motivation will not drive you to the end. You need discipline. The spiritual discipline to be reading the Bible. And I encourage you, if you've even if you've forgotten your Bible reading plan, you can just pick it up from where you left off and continue to read from there until you finish it. And so as I wrap up, because Jesus is the one and only unique Son of God, he is greater than all the prophets. He is the source of greater grace. He is the greater revelation of the Father. And so that is how John describes Jesus in the prologue. And who Jesus Christ is matters to all of us. And if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a saving relationship with him, if you're not a Christian this morning, then it matters to you infinitely. It matters to you infinitely. John wrote this gospel for a purpose. He wants to introduce you, and he wants to show you who Jesus is. John said this in John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so, as today is the last day of 2023, and even before this day ends, I pray and hope by the grace of God you don't know Christ this morning. I pray that God will save you this morning. Open up the eyes of your heart to see your own sinfulness and your desperate need for Jesus to save you. And if you, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross through his death and resurrection and believe in, G- in your heart that God raised him from the dead, surrender your life to him as your Lord and Savior, and you will be saved. You will be saved you will have eternal life. And you can begin 2024 with a fresh start in following Jesus for the rest of your life. And if that's you this morning, you can come talk to me after the service. Let's pray. Our great God and Savior, we thank you for who you are. Jesus, we marvel at who you are. You're the begotten Son. It's just our human minds cannot fully comprehend who you are because you are God and we as finite beings cannot wrap our minds around the infinite being you're so incomprehensible and we are so in awe and wonder of who you are and yet you, you also stoop down to human history you condescended into our level and you've spoken to us in a language that 
we can understand at least. And you have shown yourself through in flesh and that you've lived out the life, the perfect life, 2,000 years ago that we have all failed to live and yet you gave your life for us and that even your disciples have wrote about you and testify about you telling the world, even us, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God that came down to the world. Oh Lord, help us to behold the wondrous mystery of this gospel message. Oh Lord, I, if there are those who don't know Jesus this morning, I ask that you would do a supernatural work in their hearts because only God, ultimately, you're the one who can save them. You're the only one who can convict them of sins. You're the only one who can... You're the only one who can cause them to be born again and be regenerated. So, we depend on you. That as we go forward to 2024, help us to always walk before you. Help us to always love you. We know we can't do it ourselves. But we know by your grace and by your power or your spirit, you're the one who can help us to know you even better. So work in our hearts and be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.